future that um, about how people have felt that the pandemic has affected their lives and their mental health. We wanted to try to do something a bit different with the year in our lives. There were lots of surveys circulating, but we thought that having an opportunity for anybody, whether or not they identified as experiencing a mental health problem, just an opportunity to reflect on the impact that the pandemic and lockdowns were having on their mental health would be a fascinating project. So after discussing how we were going to do it, we opened the project in June 2020 and closed it 12 months later at the end of March 21. And two years on from that time and over 80 submissions later, we now have this incredible picture of diverse experiences, which do highlight those shared sorrows and some of the very stark inequalities that people experienced across very difficult times. And we are really delighted to be launching today an anthology of all of those pieces, which has been supported by a reflective piece written by David Gilbert. And we're going to hear from David later but his piece explores the collection as a whole and it, it traces the key themes that run through the stories. So today we want this event to honour all of those stories that we received, the experiences that they describe and the people behind them. And just before we hear from David, um, we're going to show a short video featuring a few of the contributors to the project. We started seeing the images of the, of the NHS people that had lost their lives trying to save our lives. And those faces were hugely, disproportionately black. I feel a kind of loneliness that seeing people on screen doesn't seem to ease. It's far more existential somehow. It dwells in the bones of me. I deactivated my social media to keep my mind in peace in that year. I felt like I was and I had an evil eye on me for not being happy. From the outset, I was less immediately concerned by this very real, very present virus and more consumed by the just as real, but hypothetical terrors dreamt up by my own mind. 2020 so far has pushed the boundaries of my emotional resilience and it's been challenging. They're all there, the demons in the ether, threatening my mental health threatening my sobriety. Lockdown has resuscitated them. We attended Black Lives Matter protests, even though we were criticised for doing so. I was not able to convince my white friends that I had to go. And so friendships were lost, never to return. I think the coronavirus has kept us in the palm of its hand for a long time, but the new normal life that we have adopted to has changed us for both good and bad. In some ways, the pandemic has enabled me to avoid situations which turbocharge my anxiety. I finally had a legitimate excuse for keeping my distance in social situations. The walls of well-being have been weathered, but they are not broken. My depression remains deep, but my mask is held on with a very strong glue. I just want to see people, talk to them, check they're okay. I wonder how we're supposed to grieve. I think that is quite atmospheric, isn't it? But I'm going to hand over to David now. David Gilbert is an associate of Centre for Mental Health. Um, he's an activist and a talented poet, particularly within the area of patient leadership. And he's the author of Reaching Inland, which is what we're launching today alongside the anthology. And it explores those threads that run through the collection. David, please tell us what you found. 
Well, thank you. First of all, it's, it's, it's a real privilege. It's the most joyous commission I've ever, ever, ever done. And I really want to acknowledge the courage and the craft of those who wrote in. And to the gratitude for somebody who said, we're all in the same storm, but in different boats, which I think describes both of you quite a lot. What I noticed was three things, that there were some general patterns, that there were things that affected those with mental health issues in different ways, and pieces about inclusion and diversity, and those are the three sections of the piece, interspersed with quotes. So in terms of those general patterns, what I noticed at first was the shock, the loss, the grief. As somebody said, Wuhan, how could a place I'd never heard of strike terror into my heart? And then there were the inane daily consequences, remember? As somebody put it, people like locusts strip the supermarket shelves of everything they would get, especially pasta and toilet rolls. And the anxiety daily life fraught as an optical, obstacle course. I love this quote. In a lorry park on the edge of the M6, we argue about who last had the hand sanitizer. I try not to treat the kids like biohazards. And then came the isolation and the loneliness. Lots of stories there. The death of loved ones. The inability to grieve together. The time, space, relationships, connected and boundaries. Connectedness and boundaries up for grabs bringing people together and tearing people apart. There was big stuff here too. There was lots of drama, lots of breakups, new love, trauma resurfacing and rediscoveries of sexual identity. And underneath that fear, tiredness, grief, anger, as somebody put it, I'd spent my time thinking about where we were going to get nappies. And then I thought people around us might die, unquote these daily challenges shot through by existential fears and the guilt. As somebody put it, what was my disappointment in comparison to others? But it was real and painful to me. It was my disappointment, end of quote. And people trying to make sense. We're, we're meaning making machines, quote, we have lived high on the hog of shallow surface esteem and neglected the dull budgeting, love that phrase, necessary for survival. And of course, the courage, the strength, the hope and the gratitude, the solace in small, big things, nature, time with those you loved, if you could, amid the despair. Quote, endless spring mornings clothed in a shroud of morning dew, unquote. And then dollops of gratitude. And what I loved in particular, contradictions and imperfections. One person wrote a diary, which I'd really recommend, as he followed one whole day of enjoying nature and describing that, the next day said this, quote, the injustice of having my whole life cancelled when I just started enjoying it. But then she said, but I'm allowed to be upset. So this was radical self-acceptance rather than the superficial calls we hear to be positive. So courage was not about being tough or resilient or having thick skin. In fact, the very reverse. What I seemed to witness was the bone and soul's exposure to a world without protection and erstwhile defense mechanisms. The mind and body vulnerable, the soul strong. Lots of people say, one step at a time, one step at a time. In terms of mental health, Liz is going to talk about that in more detail in a minute, but it should not be assumed that all people with mental health issues felt worse. Many welcomed the lack of stimulus, as one person put it, welcome to a world made for introverts. However, many of the pieces here are pretty gruelling, I warn you, but do take them slowly. Detailed day-by-day -day accounts, first-hand experience and expertise at navigating days, and one's left with awe and tenacity on real display, somebody put it. I've always been a solitary person. I enjoy spending time on my own. However, I'm not able to cope with being alone for too long with my thoughts. This can be a very dangerous place. Another person put it, I ache with the absence of touch in my life. Another said, my mother died of COVID without me. Guilt heaped on top of guilt, 
no social network to keep me afloat, scared to go out, panicking indoors. My mental health is always a step away from crisis. Bipolar plus coronavirus, a lethal combination. And what about those mental health workers? One put it this way. I'd always prided myself on my emotional resilience, always the one to put the mask on in order to smile, laugh and execute the day's objectives in a timely, effective manner. One supposed to have the most insight and knowledge of tools that can help keep my mental health stable and healthy. But I broke. And then on to inclusion and diversity. One black man said, Images of the NHS people that had lost their lives trying to save our lives, hugely disproportionately black. Then came the police murder of Breonna Taylor, Daniel Prude and George Floyd, and black people suffering a trauma as they saw their own sons, brothers, husbands, nephews laying on the floor saying, I can't breathe. In the care home where I worked, staff 80% black, all residents white, the residents were dropping things on the floor for staff to have to keep bending down and picking up. So keep bending down, Mike, even at work. One white gay man said this, in lockdown, white people are finally beginning to understand in some small way what living with limited liberty feels like. HIV took hold of our friends and lovers and killed them brutally violently. That pandemic changed our identities and our politics as gay men, our relationships and aspirations. The mothers who lost their sons and the men who lost their lovers still bear its consequences day in, day out. A mum said this, I know I am meant to tell you that she, a baby, is my world. I can't. I can, however, say I'm fed up to the back teeth of Mr. Bloody Tumble. I would rather stick pins in my eyes than once again have to deal with a mess of glitter and glue and paint and stickers that get stuck on everything apart from what they are meant to be stuck on. And this was the piece that finally broke me um, and may break me again. Um, and I'll tell it in full, this is an, a couple, about a minute and a half. So this is one young person, I want to tell it all. March, 2020, schools would close, drawing a sharp close to my two years spent revising A-levels, struggling for nothing. My university applications fell through when I received my results, lost, no ambitions. Weeks isolating, doing nothing. Tried to make a change, search for a job, that went nowhere. The light was fading in my mind. I hid away because not trying meant I would never see the failure of my actions. I split up with my girlfriend, lost touch with friends. All I could do was cry and look at old photographs, wake, eat, sleep, repeat. End of 2020, an old friend reconnected. I opened up to her. She spoke the same. I wasn't alone, we became closer. Spent nights video calling and gaming together. I felt wanted again, new hope. We shared feelings and counseled one another, created little goals each day, making the bed, eating three meals a day to get ourselves back on the rails. These little things boosted me. I still have many days of no en energy wanting to stay in bed, but there are those sunny days where I feel I could conquer the world. I won't let myself fall victim to giving up all hope. We've achieved so much. I want to reunite with her in person. I may have let the light fade in my mind at one time, but now I only want to see the light of the sun fade over the horizon each night for eternity. In sum, again and again I came back to this sense of life at its most raw, most distilled, close to the essence of things. As one person said, I handed in my notice so as to look after my loved one. COVID reminded me of what is really important. As an American poet, Muriel Rukesa, 
and she writes, however confused the scene of our life appears, however torn we may be who now do face that scene, it can be faced and we can go on to be whole. As we wade from the chaos without to the cohesion within, this is what we move through and move towards. So for me, these pieces are testament to the human spirit. And with COVID, only one part of current pain, unkindness and volatility, and with the earth in crisis, how we need them, and how we need these words to shape the cold laden and fear laden air. Please do read these writings. I really, really want you to read these writings that honour those who've written for and with us in mind. And I'll just give the last word to, to a guy who said, quote, I am eternally grateful for my guinea pig, Steve, as I never realised how important the comfort of having a pet was. Thank you. And thanks to, to everyone who's written in. It was an absolute joy. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's given us uh, a real, I think, uh, introduction to what more there is to find out in the whole anthology and in the piece that you've written. So we look forward to being able to spend more time really getting deep into the submissions. Our next speaker is Ibrahim Hersey, who Ibrahim is one of the center's peer researchers and is based in Birmingham. He submitted a wonderful poem for the collection and it's a real honor to have him join us on the panel today. Ibrahim, please share. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, thank you, David. Um, that was really powerful. And I just love to reiterate your point that I think is really important for us to, to read these um, these pieces, I think we have a habit of forgetting sometimes how difficult times in our life were. And I think it's gonna be, I think it's already happening now, but we're forgetting actually how difficult COVID was for us and our families and our loved ones. And so having this, and I love to, you know, also like thank Center for Mental Health for, for bringing that space about because it is very important. I think a lot of people needed it. But yeah, I think it's gonna just stand um, as an archive for, 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 for the experiences of so many people. Um, and it's going to be really important reminder for us of this time in our lives. Um, yeah, so I wrote just a little bit about how, um, how creative writing kind of helped me during, during, um, during lockdown. It was for me, um, a massive source of comfort. Um, I've been writing since I was young and, and, it acted for me in many ways as a catharsis during this period of time. And so, yeah, and then after this, I'll, I'll read um, the poem that I submitted. Um, it was very easy in the isolation of lockdown for one to feel cut off from friends and the wider community. Meeting up with each other outside is such a big part of friendship. One I think before lockdown we underestimated. The revising together at libraries, hitting each other up after work or uni to grab food, football sessions on the weekend. All of these events that once seemed mundane suddenly weighed much more in our eyes once they were taken away. One may have argued that isolation by itself during lockdown wouldn't have, said, wouldn't have had such an effect on us. This is the 21st century after all, and FaceTime, WhatsApp, Instagram, Twitter, I mean, all of these things could keep us connected with our friends and the outside world. However, these digital, these digital planes, I truly believe, can't replicate the feeling of meeting your loved ones in real life. We must also recognize the ways in which online spaces acted as a double-edged sword. Yes, they were, our, they were our only ways of communicating with the outside world, but these were also places filled with, news of, with the news of the misery that coronavirus had brought on us. Daily statistics on the numbers of people who died due, due to the virus, stories of worsening conditions all around the world, and the NHS being pushed past capacity were in effect being force fed to us, leaving us all with a cloying feeling of helplessness. Yes, it is important to stay informed and know what's going on, but all this news was for sure going to have a detrimental effect on many people's mental health. During this time, I chose to delve into writing deeply, although it was something I had been doing passionately since young, short stories, poems, essays, you name it. 
what was different what was different about lockdown however was that the writing i would be doing during this period had a singular overarching purpose keeping me healthy the pieces i had created during this time were in essence excavations muddled with film show with film shows and music reviews poetry um, and lit and journal entries they served their purpose writing allowed me to spend time focused on a single thing by expending so much energy on thinking through why i felt certain ways about certain things they allowed me to be more truthful about and to myself and it was this truth that formed the basis of the catharsis that writing brought and made writing so important to me during this period i've always been a big big advocate for writing as a form of, per, of personal therapy my work with Light Post and the Center for Mental Health allowed me to frame art as much more than just simple hobbies or something done to pass the time with. Light Post, um, for, for those of you who don't know, is a theater group for young black men, and they use uh, theater and arts to build resilience in young black men and improve their mental health. Um, so when I started working with a Center for Mental Health, one of the things I was personally fascinated by and spent a lot of time looking out for was the relationship that art had with mental health. I think the freedom afforded by art and its lack of borders is one of the reasons that it provides such relief to people. Whatever the reason it may be, with the light post, I had living proof that tapping into your creativity can help immensely with your mental health. So I'm just about to start with the poem. Um, I had one word in my mind when I was writing this poem, uncomfortable. I wanted it to act as a, I wanted to dig deeply into both the nature of lockdown and how it felt to be separated from everyone. And also the uncomfortable truths behind some of the lies that we tell ourselves. Because of these kind of very topics, I chose a form called a guzzle um, to write this poem. And one of the most striking features of a guzzle is that each stanza, each coupler is almost like a poem in its own in its own right so i'm gonna just read it now and it's called there's a bitterness that comes with cover there's a bitterness that comes with cover plants wilt people return all with cover words are the heaviest of them all each pronunciation encompasses drapes you with a cover opioids have seized my people by the soul the shame suffocates you that is a final cover a diaspora at war with itself. How many mango poems till you realize there are some things you cannot cover? She dropped her garments, he left his clothes. So many creative ways to shame for sickness. Pride acts as a post-written cover. The strength of a drum that can call through time, Festec Nigeria, Muduk Badia, and our elders with dementia, all joined by the string, by the string of a pounding cover. My ancestors wrote about winds that carry words and souls but we are left in their wake, heelless, scratching our tongue of its cover. In all, in all circumstances, we are but bone and skin and little else. But then again, maybe that's because our hirsis are little more than covers. So hirsi is my second name. And one of the things you try to do in a ghazal is add your name kind of sneakily in the last line of the poem. And, um, and it means that the meaning of the word is protection. So that's why I said at the end, um, yeah, in all circumstances, we are but humans, bones and skin and little else. But then again, maybe that's because our hirsis are little more than covers. Uh, and yeah. That's wonderful, Ibrahim. Thank you so much. Um, I think there are so many things that we can relate to in that and and yet there's so much that we can also learn from it because the experiences may be different from our own um and it's been such an honor and privilege to have you join us today thank you so much our next speaker uh, is liz main morrison who has been involved with the Year in Our Lives concept from the beginning and also contributed her own piece about her experience of lockdown. And lives, Liz work, lives in Northern Ireland and she works for another national charity. So again, wonderful to have her take part. And Liz, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I was really honoured to be involved in this project from the start. So what I'm going to do is read some extracts from the piece that I wrote, just merged together into one piece. 
um, and then talk a little bit about the impact on um, my mental health and how mental health services um, really suffered during the pandemic. It's November 2020, nearly the end of the weirdest year in my over half a century of life. Lockdown two has been extended past the original four weeks in Northern Ireland. It's not as strict as England, but it's bad enough, and I have no faith that it will end in the promised two more weeks. I thought I'd really struggle with the second lockdown, and I have, but I'm resigned now. The biggest impact on me is gym classes being banned, although thank goodness gyms are still open. Exercise is my mental health lifeline, and going back to the gym after lockdown one was the only thing that got me out of a pretty bad depression. It didn't prevent further episodes, but I was able to stick to my routine, and seeing people at the smaller classes was good crack. With just 12 people there, we talked more and I got to know my instructors really well. One of them has kept up Zoom classes a few times a week with 15 minute chat time beforehand and that's kept me going too. I then spoke a bit about Australia as I'm Australian um, and continue, but back to Australia, I can't go. And while I've been isolated here, I've lost a much loved uncle to cancer and watched his funeral online, feeling a million miles away from the few mourners. Watching a cousin break down and being unable to hug him was pure hell. The time difference meant the funeral was 1 a.m. and I sobbed alone on the sofa, FaceTiming the family when it was over and sobbing uncontrollable, uncontrollably as they gathered together and held each other. My father was in hospital when I heard the news in the middle of his night. I texted my mum who called him, but I was loath to call in case he was sleeping. But he was awake, trying to call me, but fumbling the phone and unable to. My heart broke. My dad's been in hospital a few times during lockdown, and normally I'd have gone back to Australia to support my mom and take some of the load off my siblings. If I'm honest, I don't know if I'll see him again. I don't know if I'll be able to be at his funeral to say goodbye if he does go. I don't know if it will be another online goodbye sobbing on the sofa. The day they announced lockdown, I was told my job was at risk and was being merged with the role in England. I'm passionate about the charity I work for and being furloughed with the chance of redundancy left me feeling unwanted and frankly useless. I was being told I was great at my job and at the same time feeling like I was on the scrap heap. And then I talk about fortunately being able to volunteer with um, Centre for Mental Health, which was a bit like coming home for me as I had worked with them previously. For a while, I felt the world was crashing to a halt. I almost wondered if my mother's apocalyptic beliefs were right. Was Trump the Antichrist? 2020 had fire and famine and plague, and I swear I'd heard about locusts decimating crops somewhere. My anxiety got out of hand and I stopped sleeping. I have bipolar disorder and a lack of sleep can trigger an episode, so that added to my anxiety. My GP prescribed diazepam because that works for me and it took the edge off and helped me to calm down and sleep. But even then, I felt guilty resorting to benzos, even though I know they work for me, and I'm careful to take them sparingly. My key worker has been amazing at keeping up the calls throughout, but it's not the same as seeing her. My psychiatrist has been redeployed, and I've had one phone call appointment with someone I don't know. She was lovely, but it was brief, and there was nothing she could really do to help me. And then I finished, but for all the episodes of depression and anxiety, I found a resilience I didn't know I had. Who knows what the rest of 2020 has in store for us or whether 2021 will be any better, but I guess I'll hang around to find out. Well, um, 2021 wasn't any better. And in fact, as soon as I finished writing that practically, we had another lockdown that was extremely severe and basically the same as lockdown one. And um, that really knocked me. I'd struggled with mental health services throughout. I'd had two, uh, I think the whole of lockdown, I had two psychiatric appointments um, with different psychiatrists, neither of who I'd ever met before. Um, and I talked there about how important my um, key worker was to me. Well, she suddenly disappeared. She went off sick, nobody told me, and then she left. I was leaving messages for her on her mobile phone and her office phone. So, and emailing her saying I really need to talk and getting no response I couldn't get through to the team number and I left messages and it was months before somebody actually called me back from the mental health community mental health team and told me that Mary had left 
and um, that at some point I would be getting a new key worker, but that took months and months. Um, when I did, she was great, but again, it was going back to somebody who didn't know me. Um, what I didn't know through all of this was my husband, who also has bipolar, was coping by self-medicating um, with cannabis and vaping the oil, um, which is not a good thing. And uh, almost out of the blue, I thought he was coping pretty well. And then suddenly he became psychotic, um, really acutely psychotic. And uh, my GP was great, but he couldn't get hold of mental health services. They just weren't calling him back. Um, when he eventually did, after two nights of no sleep and trying to restrain um, Michael and keep him safe, um, the uh, home treatment team um, basically said there are no beds. Fortunately, I used to work for the Royal College of Psychiatrists and have friends who are psychiatrists, and they stepped in and um, got a home treatment assessment for him. Um, and, but basically while we were waiting for a bed, he became so unwell um, that when I called the team, they said called an ambulance. And it was very frightening. He had to go to hospital. Um, it wasn't a time that you wanted to go into a hospital. The ambulance crew asked me to accompany him. Um, and I thought it would just be as far as A&E, um, but then they asked me to go in and I spent a full day looking after him in A&E, um, trying to restrain him as he kept going onto the ward and telling people he could heal them, et cetera, all the things you do when you're not your normal self. Um, eventually we got a, a bed was found and um, they asked me to go in the ambulance again to get him to the psychiatric ward. I went with him, we dropped him in. Um, I had to say goodbye at the front door. And that was the first, last time I saw him um, for, a couple of weeks because there was no visiting. Um, they didn't even ask me how I would get home. Um, my battery was pretty much flat and I had just enough to call a cab and, had just, <laughs> um, and to get home. But I was completely abandoned by mental health services at that point. They were trying to discharge him very quickly and I was having to fight with them to say, no, I know he's not well enough to come home yet. I knew if he came home, there was no support because um, I couldn't even have family visiting. Um, and I felt completely let down by mental health services at that point. So I felt when I was talking about the resilience that I'd found during lockdown, that left, that went. Um, I had to take time off work um, just because I was such a mess. And um, that was the hardest bit. It wasn't so much 2020 as 2021. Um, and I think I would have loved to have seen 2021 a year in our lives because I think that was even tougher for so many people. So that's my story and I'll hand back to Jan. Thank you, Liz. Um, that was, yeah, that was really moving. Um, thank you for your honesty and for sharing that with us. We do have uh, 15 minutes for the panel discussion. So we're going to open the chat so that you can put your comments and questions to the panel and we'll try to field those. Um, so yeah, if we can uh, maybe sort of have the panel spotlighted so people can see who's going to be answering. So that'll be our speakers, David, Ibrahim, Liz, and also Thea, who is um, who's our head of digital and comms at the centre. Um, so to kick off, um, we've got a question. Um, do you do you panel see this project as, as an example of history, therapy? art or something else? Can I answer that? Yes. <laughs> um, I think it's been a fantastic combination of all of those things. Um, I think giving people the opportunity to perhaps reflect on their year um, has been quite therapeutic and to express their own emotions and to be heard. 
um, has been really important, but I think the creative writing side for people has been a real outlet. Um, so yes, I think it's been all of those things um, and been really important in that way. David, do come in, yeah. I'm, I'm tempted to say who cares. Um, it was what it was. My, my, my less glib answer is that for me, and I don't know whether Ibrahim agrees with this, the craft on display was staggering. So one can talk a lot about the content, but these were beautifully written pieces and I wasn't expecting that, which is quite patronizing of me to think of that and it took me by surprise i'll be you know i can be quite arrogant about that and they were beautiful all of them yeah i i agree with both liz and david i mean definitely the the, the pieces that were contributed were like incredible you know i really loved reading them um not in a morbid way but in kind of all of like the 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 the, the, the level of, of kind of skill and, and, and the beauty of the writing. Um, but also like I'd love to just place emphasis on how this is this is this is history, you know, this, these are people talking about what they went through, their experiences, their feelings. And you know, in a hundred years time or 500 years time, you're gonna have a very first hand account on how normal people in their day-to-day -day lives, how this affected them away from the politics, away from the sank, away from not sanctions. So away from the away from the away from what's the word? Uh, and I'm going to be a poet. Um, but away from the away from the isolation and away from the lockdown, like we can't we can't visit other countries and so on. Away from all of that, you know, day to day people in their lives, how they were, how, how this affected them. Um, I think it's really important because of that. I guess all I follow up is obviously I'm biased being involved in the project but I do really think that that was one of the beauties of the project is that it could be all of those things and more and you know for some people it was very much about crafting a piece of art and we saw you know amazing pieces for others of us I think it was a case of let's just take some time to reflect on what we've been through and it was kind of quite cathartic in that respect I definitely felt that in writing my piece um and yeah, definitely kind of therapeutic in that respect, as, as Ibrahim um, referred to in, in his talk earlier. Um, and I should also say, because I realise we haven't mentioned this, that um, this project was kind of in the footsteps of a day in the lives um, led by Mark Brown, um, who and, and, and was, which was an amazing kind of narrative history talking about the lives of people living with mental health problems. So we wanted to kind of follow in those footsteps and give anyone whether they've got a lived experience uh, history or not the chance to kind of reflect on that thanks so um we we have had a question come in from mark brown um which david has given an answer to in the chat but it was mark um says thanks for sharing all of this stuff i was wondering what you all feel was the hardest thing to give voice to in this project are there any empty chairs at the table? I, I can take this one <laughs> from working on the project. Um, I think I would agree with what David has said in the chat um, that we, you know, this was an unfunded, very small project that we just decided to take on sort of out of love for wanting to do it. Um, but in light of that, there were definitely people that we didn't reach. Um, and we kind of brainstormed that as we went along, how can we reach, for instance, more people from racialized communities um, so that this is a more representative picture. And that was something we um, struggled to do. And I kind of, that, that's my main regret, I think, about the project. Um, so, so that's probably would be the empty chair at the table. Um, not everyone who took part was white, but a majority were. And, um, you know, if we'd had more time and more resource on this, I really would have wanted to kind of uh, explore that more and, and how we could, yeah, make it a more representative project. Thank you. Um, there's quite a lot more questions coming in. So um, Andrew Kay asked, um, how might some of this extremely powerful testimony be used for 
policymakers and mental health services to learn lessons? There's a good question. <laughs> I'll, I'll kick off and I'm happy for someone else to come in. Um, from the centre's perspective, something that we're really keen to kind of flag up in launching this is that obviously the public inquiry into COVID-19 and its impact, including impact on mental health, is upcoming. And I think we feel strongly as a team that this is a really vital foundation for that kind of exploration work. Um, this tells a narrative history from people who've, who've lived these things firsthand, including people with mental health problems. Um, and so I think, yeah, we would we would see this as a really critical foundation for that work. Um, so that's one example. Um, but I'm yeah happy for other people to, to join in. David. One one thing amongst many is that for me, this it was about process rather than content. So if we can stop these damn policy inquiries reaching into always academic data and quantitative stuff and valuing the qualitative and the nuanced and not generalizing about all people this and all people that, that this is subtle stuff. And, and the, so for me, the process is as important as the content because we have inquiry after inquiry that seems to bring in stories, but somehow not reflect them well enough in what are sometimes sort of bland recommendations that won't get implemented. Oh, one, I one just, oh, sorry. I'll try to add to that. I think it's important for other mental health charities and for people like the Royal College of Psychiatrists to read this and to take on board um, the real lived experience of what people were going through, the things like where do I get nappies from, the stresses, um, and to understand, I think it's a real opportunity for them to understand what people went through um, with first hand testimony of it um, and as David said I, I think the qualitative um, research and um, the contemporary qualitative research as well um, is really important and I do hope that's going to be taken on board um, as a real seen as an opportunity and a resource by policymakers and charities. Thanks Liz. Ibrahim do you have something to add? Yeah, I think, yeah, again, like I, I agree with both David and Liz, I, I think it's really important for, for, for policymakers to read this kind of stuff, because I feel like it's very easy to get lost in the statistics and it's very easy to, to, not, to not see that the impact, the, the real life impact on, on each singular person that your policies may have or that these large scale events have had. Um, and so I think it's really important as a, to ground a lot of these policymakers for them to read this. I think that's what it acts like uh, as a grounding. We, we've had a question from Garrett Prayag, um, and I'm not sure, the question is, where are people at now in 2022? Um, so I'm not sure whether that's like you yourselves or you know where, where, whether you think um, that things have changed for people, but it's quite, it's an interesting question. So I don't know if anyone wants to answer personally or generally, Liz? Oh, sorry, Liz, can you just... I'm muted, sorry. It's really funny you asked that because um, it's it was just going through my head and thinking that maybe we need a year in our lives 2022 um, or even to go back to contributors and I don't want to put work onto Centre for Mental Health when it's completely unfunded in particular, but to go back and say what happened next because what I told you was part of my story of what happened next. And I think the um, fatigue we've all felt with COVID and the ongoing restrictions and the ongoing fears and anxieties and the ongoing deaths and it seems never ending. I don't know about you guys, but in Northern Ireland, we've, we're in the middle of another wave of COVID. Oh. Um, so how is it the ongoing impact? Um, and I would love to see somebody fund that um, because I think it's really important that we know. Anyone else want to come in on 
hell they are or what was, what was the question? The question Sorry, is, is where writing? are people at now in 2022? It's really hard to generalise. I, I just agree with Liz about going back the weariness. I, I, I work with a lot of people who've been through life changing stuff and people are just weary, um, staff, patients. And it's almost like waking up from something and think, what the hell was that? It's like, like a hungover from something we didn't quite. And I want to remind people of what Abraham said at the beginning was something, you know, don't forget this stuff. People, people are suddenly back into thinking they can operate as normal and the volatility and social media. It feels like, you know, in some ways we've been deeply changed and in some ways we're just going at each other again. It's bizarre. Yes. Thank you. Um, I don't know if everyone can see the comments, but there is um, a helpful comment from Kadra Abdinasir, who works with us at the centre, saying, um, I went to a place to be event yesterday and they did a COVID-19 time capsule, capturing the stories of primary school children across the country. Might be good to link up if possible. So that's interesting. Um, that's great. So I guess um, we're probably out of time unless anyone else has another quick question. I'm not seeing anything else in the chat. Christina, there's a Christina Young has a question. Okay, well, can you see it and answer it? Hi, um, it's not a question. Oh, can you hear yes, me? Do. All right. Yes. Because my, my internet's a bit unstable. Uh, I just want to say that I think it would be a great idea to have another, I don't know what you'd call it, year two or where are we now? Um, something that's ongoing. And there does seem to be an assumption, although there, there was an exception it, amongst the speakers, there seems to be an assumption that everybody hated the lockdowns and the isolation, but they didn't. I loved the isolation. Um, I didn't, I live on my own. I chose not to go in a bubble. I got a lot of things done, a lot of sorting out done. Um, I, I, and I, for various other reasons, which are too long to go into, I really love that time. I'm not, of course, referring to COVID itself, which was absolutely horrendous, as one read, heard the news and so on. Um, I suppose I am a bit unique because I've no responsibilities, I'm not a carer, and I am retired, so I didn't have to worry about a job. Um, but I know there was quite a few people who actually felt better mentally during the lockdowns. Yes. Um, that, that I think David did read um, a piece that reflected that sort of view, but there's such a spectrum within the whole anthology. So um, as we come to the end now, I just really want to thank everybody who's taken part today but most importantly to thank all of you who contributed such rich pieces and helped us to make this such a completely fascinating and incredibly useful document looking at uh, the different views which you know some of which have just been expressed because this has affected each individual in in their own particular way um whether for you know positively or negatively and and there is just such a depth of experience in the document so please do download david's reflective piece and the anthology um also can i just say that if anything that you've heard today or you read in the pieces you feel is emotionally challenging and you do need support please 
get in touch with the Samaritans or the shout text line and we will put details of those organizations in the chat and there's a there's a button to link into where those sources of support are it's on the front of our web of our website so once again thank you everyone i hope you have enjoyed it as much as we have and um yeah we'll go away and think about <laughs> year in our lives 2022 2023 or whatever um it's been it's been a brilliant event and thanks so much for your participation go and find those downloads and um let us know what you think comment um join us on facebook twitter instagram and TikTok, and uh, we'd love to hear from you thank you bye bye